Before the outbreak of World War II, American intelligence operations were a fragmented collection of programs conducted by the State Department and various branches of the armed services. With the totalitarian regimes rising to power, Roosevelt needed a coherent intelligence service and someone to arbitrate squabbles among the turf conscious agencies. Sounds familiar. Some things, in fact, never change. In 1941, Roosevelt appointed one of his classmates from Columbia University, William J. Donovan, as coordinator of information, a post functionally indistinguishable from President George W. Bush's director of national intelligence. General William Wild Bill Donovan earned his nickname either for gutsy plays he made as a star quarterback for his college football team or for the fanatical training he gave his men before pushing them to their limits in combat. Donovan was one of the few men to rise from the enlisted ranks to become a general, and upon retirement he applied his experience to climbing the ladder of politics. He was appointed U.S. District Attorney of New York, but lost his run for governor, being a Republican candidate at the wrong time and place. Undeterred, Donovan launched his meteoric ascent into national prominence by being named Roosevelt's Coordinator of Information. Just five months later, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, and the president needed intelligence like never before. So Donovan was in the ideal position to head the new Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, which would later evolve into the Central Intelligence Agency. Donovan hired a Boston chemist and business executive, Stanley P. Lovell, to head up the R&D branch of, of the OSS. Lovell played the real-life role of Q in the James Bond movies, a job I've aspired to my entire career. <laughs> Working with his staff to invent spy gadgets ranging from tiny cameras to explosives disguised as dinner. Nothing was too absurd, well, not even as we shall see, six-legged commandos. Lovell was at the center of a plot to undermine the Fuhrer's charisma by injecting his vegetables with estrogen to cause his mustache to fall out and his voice to become soprano. His branch developed a capsule of mustard gas, gotta follow me here, capsule of mustard gas that was to be dropped into a flower arrangement during a high-level meeting of the enemy as part of a plan to blind the German high command, upon which the Pope would announce that God had punished the Nazis, <laughs> thereby causing the Roman Catholic soldiers among the Axis forces to lay down their arms. Really? <laughs> then came the mission that called for a weapon so bizarre as to make these earlier boondoggles seem downright reasonable. In February 1942, General Rommel's Africa Corps pummeled U.S. forces in North Africa, and the Americans became worried their defeat would encourage fascist Spain to join the Axis alliance. Moreover, the Germans were amassing troops in Morocco in preparation for cutting off the railroad from Casablanca to Algiers, the sole supply line for Allied forces. A covert operation was needed to debilitate the German troops, break the momentum of the Axis, and save the Allied lifeline. This required something far beyond feminizing the Fuhrer or blinding some German generals. This required incapacitating thousands of soldiers without being detected. This called for flies. The plan was to weaken the enemy forces by using flies to spread a witch's brew of pathogens. Given the agency's inability to rear an army of flies, Lovell decided to conscript the local vectors. Now, he didn't know it, but North American houseflies couldn't have held a candle to their desert kin. Modern biological warfare researchers have considered using a Middle Eastern strain of these insects to disseminate anthrax in light of the insect's merciless pursuit of moisture from the eyes, noses, and mouths of humans. But today's tactician would face the same logistical problem that confronted the OSS. How do you contaminate a few million flies with a pathogen? Lovell was a chemist, but apparently he'd been out of the laboratory often enough to know that flies love dung. And with a bit of research, he discovered a key demographic fact. There were more goats than people in Morocco. And goats are prolific producers of poop. Lovell now had the secret formula. Microbes plus feces plus flies equals sick Germans. Now all he needed was a few tons of goat droppings 
as a carrier for laboratory cultured pathogens. The OSS collaborated closely with Canadian entomological warfare experts to launch one of the most preposterous innovations in the history of clandestine weaponry, synthetic goat dung. Of course, flies are no fools. They won't be taken in by any old brown lump. So the OSS added a chemical attractant. The nature of this lure is not clear, but a bit of sleuthing can provide us with some clues. Allied scientists might have crafted a chemical dinner bell by collecting and concentrating the stinky chemicals we associate with human feces, indole and the appropriately named scat hole. While these extracts would have worked, the more likely attractant was a blend of organic acids, some of which had been known for more than 150 years. The two smelliest of these are caproic and caprylic acids, which by no coincidence derive their names from caprinus, meaning goat. Etymologically, as well as entomologically astute, Lovell named his operation Project Capricious. So with a scent to entice the flies, Lovell's team then coated the rubbery pellets in bacteria to complete, complete the lures. All the Americans had to do was drop loads of pathogenic pseudo-poop over the towns and villages while the German, where the Germans were garrisoned. Millions of local flies would be drawn to the bait, pick up the microbes, and dutifully deliver the bacteria to the enemy. Now Lovell worried a bit about keeping the operation clandestine. The Moroccans had to be persuaded that finding goat droppings on the roofs in the morning after Allied aircraft had flown over the previous evening was sheer coincidence. Presumably a good disinformation campaign can dispel almost any suspicion, or as Lovell intimated, if the plan succeeded, there would not be many people in any condition to raise annoying questions about fecal pellets on rooftops. Lovell's need for secrecy pertained not only to the enemy, but also to his own agency. Operation Capricious was not revealed to Donovan, who, being a soldier's soldier, would likely have nixed the use of biological weapons as being dishonorable. In the end, however, Lovell didn't have to worry about getting caught by either friends or foes, as the secret weapon was never deployed. Just as the OSS was gearing up to launch the sneak attack, the German troops were withdrawn to Spanish Morocco. I suspect they might have preferred to take their chances with pathogen-laden flies, given that Hitler was sending them to the bloody siege of Stalingrad. Such opportune turns in war, rather than moral principle, are what kept the Americans and British from using biological and chemical weapons. Churchill was prepared to defend his nation with poison gas, had the Germans landed on the British shores. And Truman's willingness to use atomic bombs against Japan leaves little doubt he would have authorized biological weapons had the situation been sufficiently dire. Although the Americans were never desperate enough to use insects against their enemies, the US military battled insects in a series of encounters that changed the course of the war. And at that point, I, I talk about the war in the Pacific and the importance that, that the, um, the US Medical Corps, the Army Medical Corps played in terms of battling um, malaria and insect-borne diseases. So you can see from this, sort of section that the U.S. took some, well, pretty wild innovations when, when entomological weapons were, were in the hands of the, the intelligence agencies. Things got a bit more serious when, um, when the uh, entomological warfare was taken over by the military. Um, in particular, um, to bring you sort of up to speed on the next section, the U.S. Entomological Warfare Division emerges in Fort Detrick, Maryland, um, and, and things start getting deadly serious. So we're going to now move, jump ahead to the Cold War, just tell you that early experiments had used simulants, um, non-pathogenic bacteria, which, the, um, which uh, uh, the U.S. military actually spread over civilian targets during the Cold War without informing the population. Um, and the initial results of this were pretty promising, but um, the, the, um, uh, the experts eventually came across some limits to this sort of a system. And, and came to the conclusion that, that the microbiologists really were in the same position as Unit 731, that without something to carry the microbes um, to the targets, um, the use of these pathogens was going to be fairly limited. So now we're going to take a look at what the United States was up to during the, uh, the Cold War, and in particular our use of fleas and mosquitoes. <laughs> 